What's up, everybody? Welcome to Political Fight Club. This is our book club, so it's not a political episode. We're going to be reading the first part of Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I told you guys we were going to do this, and by popular demand, this is really the book that you guys chose, so we're going to go through it. It's in four different parts. The first two episodes here are going to be pretty long. I don't know how long, an hour, maybe a little bit longer than that. We're going to read 48 pages today, 48 pages tomorrow or on a different day. And then uh, the second two episodes will be much shorter than that. But this is one of those books where I'd rather than just giving you my review is literally read it to you so you can get the whole impact and the beauty of it. It really did change my life. I read this a decade ago and it really did help me. The premise behind the book is Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who was in numerous death camps, Nazi death camps. He survived. I think he was in four different camps over three different years, and many of his family members were killed in Auschwitz. So he wrote this afterwards, and it's about coping with trauma and finding meaning in your life even when the trauma that is hitting you is so horrible that it's inhuman. And it really does strike a nerve and help a lot today, I would think, because a lot of us are going through so much shit. This is one of those things where reading this book out loud to you, I feel like will actually help some people out there. I highly recommend you just read it yourself, but if you don't want to, you can just listen to me read it here. It'll take me about probably three, three and a half hours total through all the episodes to get through it. So let's start with experiences in a concentration camp. And I'll keep my commentary to a minimum here. It's mostly going to be me just reading. This book does not claim to be an account of facts and events, but of personal experiences, experiences which millions of prisoners have suffered time and again. It is the inside story of a concentration camp told by one of its survivors. This tale is not concerned with the great horrors, which have already been described enough, though less often believed, but with the multitude of small torments. In other words, it will try to answer this question. How is everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? Most of the events described here did not take place in the large and famous camps, but in the small ones where most of the real extermination took place. This story is not about suffering and death of great heroes and martyrs, nor is it about the prominent kapos, prisoners who acted as trustees, having special privileges, or well-known prisoners. Thus, it is not so much concerned with the sufferings of the mighty, but with the sacrifices, the crucifixion, and the deaths of the great army of unknown and unrecorded victims. It was these common prisoners who bore no distinguishing marks on their sleeves whom the Kapos really despised. While these ordinary prisoners had little or nothing to eat, the Kapos were never hungry. In fact, many of the Kapos fared better in the camp than they had in their entire lives. Often, they were harder on the prisoners than the guards were, and beat them more cruelly than the SS men did. These capos, of course, were chosen only from those prisoners whose characters promised to make them suitable for such procedures, and if they did not comply with what was expected of them, they were immediately demoted. They soon became much like the SS men, and the camp wardens, and may be judged on similar psychological basis. It is easy for the outsider to get the wrong conception of camp life a conception mingled with sentiment and pity. Little does he know of the hard fight for existence which raged among the prisoners. This was an unrelenting struggle for daily bread and for life itself, for one's own sake or for that of a good friend. Let us take the case of a transport which was officially announced to transfer a certain number of prisoners to another camp, but it was a fairly safe guess that its final destination would be the gas chambers. A selection of sick or feeble prisoners incapable of work would be sent to one of the big central camps which were fitted with gas chambers and crematoriums. The selection process was the signal for a free fight among all the prisoners or of a group against group. All that mattered was that one's own name and that of one's friend were crossed off the list of victims, though everyone knew that for each man saved another victim had to be found. A definite number of prisoners had to go with each transport. It did not really matter which, since each of them was nothing but a number. On their admission to the camp, at least this was the method at Auschwitz, all their documents had been taken from them, together with their other possessions. 
Each prisoner, therefore, had had an opportunity to claim a fictitious name or a profession, and for various reasons many did this. The authorities were interested only in the captives' numbers. These numbers were often tattooed on their skin, and also had to be sewn to a certain spot on the trousers, jacket, or coat. Any guard who wanted to make a charge against a, charge against a prisoner just glanced at his number, and how we dreaded such glances. He never asked for his name. To return to the convoy about to depart, there was neither time nor desire to consider moral or ethical issues. Every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home, and to save his friends. With no hesitation, therefore, he would arrange for another prisoner, another number, to take his place on the transport. As I've already mentioned, the process of selecting capos was a negative one. Only the most brutal of the prisoners were chosen for this job, although there were some happy exceptions. But apart from the selection of Kapos, which was undertaken by the SS, there was a sort of self-selecting process going on the whole time among all of the prisoners. On the average, only those prisoners could keep alive who, after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples in their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft, and betrayal of their friends, in order to save themselves. We who have come back, by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know the best of us did not return. Many factual accounts about concentration camps are already on record. Here the facts will be significant only as far as they are part of a man's experiences. It is the exact nature of these experiences that the following essay will attempt to describe. For those who have been inmates in a camp, it will attempt to explain their experiences in the light of present-day knowledge, and for those who have never been inside, it may help them comprehend, and above all understand, the experiences of that only a too small percentage of prisoners who survived and who now find life very difficult. These former prisoners often say, quote, We dislike talking about our experiences. No explanations are needed for those who have been inside, and the others will understand neither how we felt then nor how we feel now. To attempt a methodical presentation of the subject is very difficult, as psychology requires a certain scientific de detachment. But does a man who makes his observations while he himself is a prisoner possess the necessary detachment? Such detachment is granted to the outsider, but he is far too removed to make any statements of real value. Only the man inside knows. His judgments may not be objective, his evaluations may be out of proportion. This is inevitable. An attempt must be made to avoid any personal bias, and that is the real difficulty of a book of this kind. At times it will be necessary to have the courage to tell of very intimate experiences. I had intended to write this book anonymously, using my prison number only, but when the manuscript was completed I saw that as an anonymous publication it would lose half its value and that I must have the courage to state my convictions openly. I therefore refrain from deleting any of the passages in spite of an intense dislike of exhibitionism. I shall leave it to others to distill the contents of this book into dry theories. These might become a contribution to the psychology of prison life, which was investigated after the First World War, and which acquainted us with the syndrome of barbed wire sickness. We are indebted to the Second World War for enriching our knowledge of the, quote, psychopathology of the masses, if I may quote a variation of the well-known phrase and title of a book by Le Bon, for the war gave us the war of nerves, and it gave us the concentration camp. As this story is about my experiences as an ordinary prisoner, it is important that I mention, not without pride, that I was not employed as a psychiatrist in camp, or even as a doctor, except for the last few weeks. A few of my colleagues were lucky enough to be employed in poorly heated first aid posts applying bandages made of scraps of waste paper, but I was number 119,104, and most of the time I was digging and laying tracks for railway lines. At one time my job was to dig a tunnel without help for a water main under a road. This feat did not go unrewarded. Just before Christmas 1944, I was presented with a gift of so-called quote-unquote premium coupons. 
These were issued by the construction firm to which we were practically sold as slaves. The firm paid the camp authorities a fixed price per day per prisoner. The coupons cost the firm 50 fennings each and could be exchanged for six cigarettes, often weeks later, although they sometimes lost their validity. I became the proud owner of a token worth 12 cigarettes, but more important, the cigarettes could be exchanged for 12 soups, and 12 soups were often a very real respite from starvation. The privilege of actually smoking cigarettes was reserved for the capo, who had his assured quota of weekly coupons, or possibly for a prisoner who worked as a foreman in a warehouse or workshop and received a few cigarettes in exchange for doing dangerous jobs. The only exceptions to this were those who had lost the will to live and wanted to quote-unquote enjoy their last days. Thus, when we saw a comrade smoking his own cigarettes, we knew that he had given up faith in his strength to carry on, and once lost, the will to, to live is seldom returned. When one examines the vast amount of material which has been amassed as a result of many prisoners' observations and experiences, three phases of inmates' mental reactions to camp life become apparent. The period following his admission, the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. Under certain conditions, shock may even precede the prisoner's formal admission to the camp. I shall give as an example the circumstances of my own admission. 1,500 persons had been traveling by train for several days and nights. There were 80 people in each coach. All had to lie on top of their luggage, the few remnants of their personal possessions. The carriages were so full that only the top parts of the windows were free to let in the gray of dawn. Everyone expected the train to head for some munitions factory in which we would be employed as forced labor. We did not know whether we were still in Silesia or already in Poland. The engine's whistle had an uncanny sound, like a cry for help sent out in commiseration for the unhappy load which it was destined to lead to, into perdition. Then the train stunted or shunted, obviously nearing a main station. Suddenly a cry broke from the ranks of the anxious passengers. There's a sign, Auschwitz. Everyone's heart missed a beat at that moment, Auschwitz. The very name stood for all that was horrible. Gas chambers, crematoriums, massacres. Slowly, almost hesitatingly, the train moved on as if it wanted to spare its passengers the dreadful realization as long as possible. Auschwitz. With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences watchtowers, searchlights, and long columns of ragged human figures, gray in the grayness of dawn, trekking along the straight desolate roads to what destination we did not know. There were isolated shouts and whistles of command. We did not know their meaning. My imagination led me to, the, to see gallows with people dangling on them. I was horrified, but this was just as well, because step by step, we had to become accustomed to a terrible and immense horror. Eventually, we moved into the station. The initial silence was interrupted by shouted commands. We were to hear these rough, shrill tones from then on, over and over again in all the camps. Their sound was almost like the, the last cry of a victim, and yet there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarse, hoarseness, as if it came from the throat of a man who had to keep shouting like that, a man who was being murdered again and again. The carriage doors were flung open and a small detachment of prisoners stormed inside. They, were stripped, they wore striped uniforms. Their heads were shaved, but they looked well fed. They spoke in every possible European tongue, and all with a certain amount of humor, which sounded grotesque under the circumstances. Like a drowning man clutching a straw, my inborn optimism, which has often controlled my feelings even in the most desperate situations, clung to this thought. These prisoners look quite well. They seem to be in good spirits and even laugh. Who knows? I might manage to share their favorable position. In psychiatry, there is a certain condition known as delusion of reprieve. The condemned man, immediately before his execution, gets the illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. We, too, clung to shreds of hope and believed to the last moment that it would not be so bad. 
Just the sight of the red cheeks and the round faces of those prisoners was a great encouragement. Little did we know, then, that they formed a specially chosen elite, who for years had been the receiving squad for new transports as they rolled into the station day after day. They took charge of the new arrivals and their luggage, including scarce items and smuggled jewelry. Auschwitz must have been a strange spot in this Europe of all the last years of the war. There must have been a unique, unique treasures of gold and silver, platinum and diamonds, not only in the huge storehouses, but also in the hands of the SS. Fifteen hundred captives were cooped up in a shed built to accommodate probably two hundred at the most. We were cold and hungry, and there was not enough room for everyone to squat on the bare ground, let alone to lie down. One five-ounce piece of bread was our only food in four days, yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the shed bargain with one member of the receiving party about a tie pin made of platinum and diamonds. Most of the profits would eventually be traded for liquor, schnapps. I do not remember any more just how many thousands of marks were needed to purchase the quantity of schnapps required for a quote-unquote gay evening, but I do know that those long-term prisoners needed schnapps. Under such conditions, who could blame them for trying to dope themselves? There was another group of prisoners who got liquor supplied in almost unlimited quantities by the SS. These were the men who were employed in the gas chambers and crematoriums, and who knew very well that one day they would be relieved by a new shift of men and that they would have to leave their enforced role of executioner and become victims themselves. Nearly everyone in our transport lived under the illusion that he would be reprieved that everything would yet be well. We did not realize the meaning behind the scene that was to follow presently. We were told to leave our luggage in the train and fall into two lines, women on one side, men on the other, in order to file past a senior SS officer. Surprisingly enough, I had the courage to hide my haversack under my coat. My line filed past the officer man by man. I realized it would be dangerous if the officer spotted my bag. He would at least knock me down. I knew that from previous experiences. Instinctively, I straightened on the approaching of the officer so that he would not notice my heavy load. Then I was face to face with him. He was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. What a contrast to us who were untidy and grimy after our long journey. He had assumed an attitude of careless ease, supporting his right elbow with his left hand. His right hand was lifted, and with the forefinger of that hand, he pointed very leisurely to the right or to the left. None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind that little movement of one man's finger, pointing now to the right, now to the left, but far more frequently to the left. It was my turn. Somebody whispered to me that to be sent to the right would mean work, the way of the left being for the sick and those incapable of work would be sent to a special camp. I just waited for things to take their course, the first of many such times to come. My haversack weighed me down a bit to the left, but I made an effort to walk upright. The SS man looked me over, appeared to hesitate, and then put both his hands on my shoulders. I tried very hard to look smart, and he turned my shoulders very slowly until I faced right, and I moved over to that side. The significance of the finger game was explained to us that evening. It was the first selection, the first verdict made on our existence or non-existence. For the great majority of our transport, about 90%, it meant death. Their sentence was carried out within the next few hours. Those who were sent to the left marched from the station straight to the crematorium. This building, as I was told by someone who worked there, had the word bath written over its doors in several European languages. Upon entering, each prisoner was handed a piece of soap and then, but mercif mercifully, I do not need to describe the events which followed. Many accounts have been written about this horror. We who were saved, the minority of our transport, found out the truth in the evening. I inquired from the prisoners who had been there for some time where my colleague and friend P, that's what he calls him, had been sent. Was he sent to the left side? Yes, I replied. Then you can see him there, I was told. Where? A hand pointed to the chimney a few hundred yards off, which was sending a column of flame up into the gray sky of Poland. It dissolved into a sinister cloud of smoke. That's where your friend is, floating up to heaven, was the answer. 
but I still did not understand until the truth was explained to me in plain words. But I am telling things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, long way in front of us, from the break of that dawn at the station until our first night's rest at the camp. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station, past electrically charged barbed wire, through the camp to the cleansing station. For those of us who had passed the first selection, this was a real bath. Again, our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. Soon we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as they saw watches on our wrists and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. We would not have to hand over all our possessions anyway, and why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day he would do, a good, do one a good turn. We waited in a shed, which seemed to be an anteroom, to the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared and spread out blankets into which we had to throw all of our possessions, all of our watches and jewelry. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked, to the amusement of the more seasoned ones who were there as helpers, if they could not keep a wedding ring, a medal, or a good luck piece. No one could yet gras grasp the fact that everything would be taken away. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence. Approaching him furtively, I pointed to the roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, Look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you will say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that that should be all I can expect of fate, but I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all costs. It contains my life's work. Do you understand that? Yes, he was beginning to understand. A grin spread slowly over his face, first piteous, then more amused mocking, insulting, and then he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question, a word that was ever, ple ever present in the vocabulary of camp inmates. Shit! At that moment, I saw the plain truth and did what marked the culmination point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former life. Suddenly there was a stir among my fellow travelers, who had been standing about with pale, frightened faces, hopelessly debating. Again we heard the hoarsely, sh hoarsely shouted commands. We were driven with blows into the immediate anteroom of the bath. There we assembled around an SS man who waited until we had all arrived. Then he said, I will give you two minutes, and I shall time you by my watch. In these two minutes, you will get fully undressed, drop everything on the floor where you're standing. You will take nothing with you except your shoes, your belt, or suspenders, and possibly a truss. I am starting to count now. With unthinkable haste, people tore off their clothes. As the time grew shorter, they became increasingly nervous and pulled clumsily at their underwear belts and shoelaces. Then we heard the first sounds of whipping leather straps beating down on naked bodies. Next, we were herded into another room to be shaved. Not only our heads were shorn, but not a hair was left on our entire bodies. Then onto the showers, where we were lined up again. We hardly recognized each other, but with great relief, some people noted that real water dripped from the sprays. While we were waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought home to us. We really had nothing now except for our bare bodies, even minus hair. All we possessed, literally, was our naked existence. What else remained for us as a material link with our former lives? For me, there were my glasses and my belt. The latter I had to exchange on later on for a piece of bread. There was an extra bit of excitement in store for the owners of trusses. In the evening, the senior prisoner in charge of our hut welcomed us with a speech in which he gave us his word of honor that he would hang personally from that beam, he pointed to it, any person who had sewn money or precious stones into his truss. Proudly, he explained that as a senior inhabitant of the camp, laws entitled him to do so. Where our shoes were concerned, matters were not so simple. Although we were supposed to keep them, those who had fairly decent pairs had to give them up, after all, and were given in exchange shoes that did not fit. In for real trouble were those prisoners who had followed the apparently well-meant advice given in the anteroom of the senior prisoners and had shortened their jackboots by cutting the tops off, then smearing soap on the cut edges to hide the sabotage. The SS men seemed to have waited for just that. All suspected of this crime had to go into a small adjoining room. After a time, we again heard the lashings of the strap. 
and the screams of tortured men. This time it lasted for quite a while. Thus, the illusions some of us still had were destroyed one by one, and then, quite unexpectedly, most of us were overcome by a grim sense of humor. We knew that we had nothing to lose except for our so ridiculously naked lives. When the showers started to run, we all tried very hard to make fun, both about ourselves and about each other. After all, real water did flow from the sprays. Apart from that strange kind of humor, another sensation seized us. Curiosity. I have experienced this kind of curiosity before, as a fundamental reaction towards certain strange circumstances. When my life was once endangered by a climbing accident, I felt only one sensation at the critical moment. Curiosity. Curiosity as to whether I should come out of it alive or with a fractured skull or other injuries. Cold curiosity predominated even in Auschwitz, somehow detaching the man, or the mind, from its surroundings, which came to be regarded with a kind of objectivity. At that time, one cultivated this state of mind as a means of protection. We were anxious to know what would happen next, and what would be the consequence. For example, of our standing in the open air, in the chill of late autumn, stark naked, and still wet from the showers. In the next few days, our curiosity evolved into surprise, surprise that we did not catch cold. There were many similar surprises in store for new arrivals. The medical men among us learned, first of all, quote, textbooks tell lies. Somewhere it is said that man cannot exist without sleep for more than a stated number of hours. Quite wrong. I had been convinced that there were certain things I could just not do. I could not sleep without this, or I could not live without that or the other thing. The first night in Auschwitz, we slept in beds were, which were constructed in tiers. On each tier, measuring about six and a half feet to eight feet, slept nine men directly on the boards. Two blankets were shared by each nine men. We could, of course, lie only on our sides, crowded and huddled against one another, which had some advantages because of the bitter cold. Though it was forbidden to take shoes up to the bunks, some people did use them secretly as pillows, in spite of the fact that they were caked with mud. Otherwise, one's head had to rest on the crook of an almost dislocated arm, and yet sleep came and brought oblivion and relief from pain for a few hours. I would like to mention a few similar surprises on how much we could endure. We were unable to clean our teeth, and yet in spite of that, a severe vitamin deficiency, we had healthier gums than ever before. We had to wear the same shirts for a half a year until they lost all appearance of being shirts. For days, we were unable to wash, even partially, because of frozen water pipes. And yet the sores and abrasions on hands, which were dirty from work in the soil, did not suppurate. That is, useless. There was actually frostbite. For instance, a light sleeper, who used to be disturbed by the slightest noise in the next room, now found himself lying pressed against a comrade who snored loudly a few inches from his ear and yet slept quite soundly through that noise. If someone now asked us the truth of Dostoevsky's statement that flatly defines a man as being who can get a being who can get used to anything, we would reply, quote, "Yes, a man can get used to anything, but do not ask us how." But our psychological investigations have not taken us that far yet. Neither had we prisoners reached that point. We were still in the first phase of our psychological reactions. The thought of suicide was entertained by nearly everyone, if only for a brief time. It was born of the hopelessness of the situation, the constant danger of death looming over us daily and hourly, and the closeness of the death suffered by many others we knew. From personal convictions, which will be mentioned later, I made myself a firm promise on my first evening in the camp that I would not run into the wire. This was a phrase used in camp to describe the most popular method of suicide, touching the electrically charged barbed wire fence. It was not entirely difficult for me to make this decision. There was little point in committing suicide since, for the average inmate, life expectation, calculating objectively and counting like all likely chances, was very poor. He could not with any assurance expect to be among the small percentage of men who survived all these selections. The prisoner of Auschwitz, in the first phase of shock, did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors for him after the first few days. After all, they spared him of the act of committing suicide. 
Friends whom I have met later have told me that I was not one of those whom the shock of admission greatly depressed. I only smiled, and quite sincerely, when the following episode occurred the morning after our first night in Auschwitz. In spite of strict orders not to leave our blocks, a colleague of mine who had arrived in Auschwitz several, several weeks previously smuggled himself into our hut. He wanted to calm and comfort us and tell us a few things. He had become so thin that at first we did not recognize him. With a show of good humor and devil-may-care attitude, he gave us a few hurried tips. Don't be afraid. Don't fear the selections. Dr. M, the SS medical chief, has a soft spot for doctors. This was wrong. My friend's kindly words were misleading. One prisoner, the doctor of a block of huts and a man of some 60 years, told me how he had entered Dr. M to let and treated Dr. M to let off his son, who was destined for gas chambers. Dr. M coldly had refused. But one thing I beg of you, he continued, shave daily if at all possible, even if you have to use a piece of glass to do it, even if you have to give your last piece of bread for it. You will look younger and the scraping will make your cheeks look ruddier. If you want to stay alive, there's only one way. Look fit for work. If you even limp, because let us say you have a small blister on your heel, and an SS man spots this, he will wave you aside, and the next day you are sure to be gassed. Do you know what we mean by a Muslim? A man who looks miserable, down and out, sick and emaciated, and who cannot manage hard physical labor any longer? That is a Muslim. Sooner or later, usually sooner, Every Muslim go to the gas chambers. Therefore, remember, shave, stand, and walk smartly. Then you need not be afraid of gas. All of you standing here, even if you have only been here 24 hours, you need not fear gas, except perhaps you. And then he pointed to me and said, I hope you don't mind me telling you frankly. To the others, he repeated, Of all of you, he is the only one who must fear the next election. So don't worry. And I smiled. I am now convinced that anyone in my place on that day would have done the same. Give me one second. I think it was Lessing who once said, There are things which must cause you to lose your reason, or you have none to lose. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is a normal behavior. Even we psychiatrists expect the reactions of a man to an abnormal situation, such as being committed to an asylum, to be abnormal in proportion to the degree of his normality. The reaction of a man to his admission to a concentration camp also represents an abnormal state of mind, but judged objectively, it is a normal and, as will be shown later, typical reaction to the given circumstances. These reactions, as I have described them, began to change in a few days. The prisoner passed from the first to the second phase, the phase of rel relative apathy in which he achieved a kind of emotional death. Apart from the already described reactions, the newly arrived prisoner experienced the tortures of other most painful emotions, all of which he tried to deaden. First of all, there was his boundless longing for his home and his family. This often could become so acute that he felt himself consumed by longing. Then there was disgust disgust with all the ugliness which surrounded him, even in, in its mere external forms. Most of the prisoners were given a uniform of rags, which would be, have made a scarecrow elegant by comparison. Between the huts and the camp lay pure filth, and the more one worked to clear it away, the more one had to come into contact with it. It was a favorite practice to detail a new arrival to a work group whose job was to clean the, the latrines and remove the sewage. If, as usually happened, some of the excrement splashed into his face during its transport over bumpy fields, any sign of disgust by the prisoner or attempt to wipe off the filth would only be punished with a blow from a capo. And thus the mortification of normal reactions was hastened. At first, the prisoner looked away if he saw the punishment parades of another group. He could not bear to see his fellow prisoners march up and down for hours in the mire, their movements directed by blows. Days or weeks later, things changed. Early in the morning, when it was still dark, the prisoner stood in front of the gate with his detachment ready to march. He heard a scream and saw how a comrade was knocked down, pulled to his feet again, and then knocked down once more. And why? He was feverish, but had reported to sickbay at an improper time. 
he was being punished for his irregular attempt to be relieved of his duties. But the prisoner who had passed into the second stage of his psychological reactions did not avert his eyes anymore. By then, his feelings were blunted, and he watched unmoved. Another example, he found himself waiting at sickbay, hoping to be granted two days of light work instead of the camp, inside of the camp because of injuries or perhaps edema or fever. He stood unmoved while a 12-year-old boy was carried in who had been forced to stand at detention for hours in the snow or to work outside with bare feet because there were no shoes for him in the camp. His toes had become frostbitten, and the doctor on duty picked off the black gangrenous stumps with tweezers, one by one. Disgust, horror, and pity are emotions that our spectator could not feel anymore. The sufferers, the dying and the dead, became such commonplace sights to him after a few weeks of camp life that he could not be moved by them anymore. I spent some time in a hut for typhus patients who ran very high temperatures and were often delirious, many of them moribund, which means bedridden. After one of them had just died, I watched without any emotional upset the scene that followed, which was repeated over and over again with each death. One by one, the prisoners approached the still warm body. One grabbed the remains of a messy meal of potatoes, another decided that the corpse's wooden shoes were an improvement on his own and exchanged them. A third man did the same with the dead man's coat, and another was glad to be able to secure some, just imagine, genuine string. All this I watched with unconcern. Eventually I asked the nurse to remove the body. When he decided to do so, he took the corpse by its legs, allowing it to drop into the small corridor between the two rows of boards, which were the beds for the 50 typhus patients, and dragged it across the bumpy earthen floor towards the door. The two steps which led into the open air always constituted a problem for us since we were exhausted from a chronic lack of food. After a few months stay in the camp, we could not walk up those steps, which were each about six inches high, without putting our hands on the door jams to pull ourselves up. The man with the corpse approached the steps. Wearily he dragged himself up, then the body, first the feet, then the trunk, and finally, with an uncanny rattling noise, the head of the corpse bumped up the two steps. My place was on the opposite side of the hut next to the small sole window which was built near the floor. While my cold hands clasped a bowl of hot soup from which I sipped greedily, I happened to look out the window. The corpse which had just been removed stared in at me with glazed eyes. Two hours before I had spoken to that man. Now I continued sipping my soup. If my lack of emotion had not surprised me from the standpoint of a professional interest, I would not remember this incident now, because there was so little feeling involved in it. Apathy. The blunting of the emotions and the feeling that one could not care anymore were the symptoms arising during the second stage of the prisoner's psychological reactions, and which eventually made him insensitive to daily and hourly beatings. By means of this insensibility, the prisoner soon surrounded himself with a very necessary protective shell. Beatings occurred on the slightest provocation, sometimes for no reason at all. For example, bread was rationed at our work site and we had to line up for it. Once, the man behind me stood off a little to one side and that lack of symmetry displeased the SS guard. I did not know what was going on in the line behind me, nor in the mind of the SS guard, but suddenly I received two sharp blows to my head. Only then did I spot the guard at my side who was using his stick. At such a moment, it is not physical pain which hurts the most, and this applies to adults as much as punished children. It is the mental agony caused by the injustice, the unreasonableness of it all. Strangely enough, a blow which does not even find its mark can, under some, some circumstances, hurt more than one that finds its mark. Once I was standing on a railway track in a snowstorm. In spite of the weather, our party had to keep on working. I worked quite hard at mending the track with gravel, since that was the only way to keep warm. For only one moment, I paused to get my breath to lean on my shovel. Unfortunately, the guard turned around just then and thought I was loafing. The pain he caused me was not from any insults or any blows. That guard did not think it worth his while to say anything, not even a swear word, to the ragged, emaciated figure standing before him, which probably reminded him only vaguely of human form. Instead, 
he playfully picked up a stone and threw it at me. That, to me, seemed the way to attract the attention of a beast, to call a domestic animal back to its job, a creature with which you have so little in common that you do not even punish it. The most painful part of beatings is the insult which they imply. At one time we had to carry some long heavy girders over icy tracks. If one man slipped, he endangered not only himself but all the others who carried the same girder. An old friend of mine had a congenitally dislocated hip. He was glad to be capable of working in spite of it since the physically disabled were almost certainly sent to death when selection took place. He limped over the track with an especially heavy girder and seemed about to fall and drag the others with him. As yet, I was not carrying a girder, so I jumped to his assistance without stopping to think. I was immediately hit on the back, rudely reprimanded, and ordered to return to my place. A few minutes previously, the same guard who struck me had told us deprecatingly that we pigs lacked the spirit of comradeship. Another time, in a forest, with the temperature at 2 degrees Fahrenheit, we began to dig up topsoil, which was frozen hard, in order to lay water pipes. By then I had grown rather weak physically. Along came a foreman with chubby rosy cheeks. His face definitely reminded me of a pig's head. I noticed that he wore lovely warm gloves in that bitter cold. For a time, he watched me silently. I felt that trouble was brewing, for in front of me lay the mound of earth which showed exactly how much I had dug. Then he began, You pig! I have been watching you the whole time. I'll teach you to work, yet Wait till you dig dirt with your teeth. You'll die like an animal. In two days, I'll finish you off. You've never done a stroke of work in your life. What were you, swine? A businessman? I was past caring, but I had to take his threat of killing me seriously, so I straightened up and looked him directly in the eye. I was a doctor. A specialist. What? A doctor? I bet you got a lot of money out of people. As it happens, I did most of my work for no money at all, in clinics for the poor. But now, I had said too much. He threw himself on me and knocked me down, shouting like a madman. I can no longer remember what he shouted. I want to show with this apparently trivial story that there are moments when indignation can rouse even a seemingly hardened prisoner. Indignation, not about cruelty or pain, but about the insult connected with it. That time blood rushed to my head because I had to listen to a man judge my life who had so little idea of it. A man, I must confess, the following remark which I made to my fellow prisoners after the scene afforded me childish relief, quote, who looked so vulgar and brutal that the nurse in the outpatient ward in my hospital would not even have, it had Im have admitted him to the waiting room. Fortunately, the capo in my working party was obligated to me. He had taken a liking to me because I listened to his love stories and matrimonial troubles, which he poured out during the long marches of our work site. I had made an impression on him with my diagnosis of his character and with my psychotherapeutic advice. After that, he was grateful, and this had already been of value to me. On several previ previous occasions, he had reserved a place for me next to him on one of the first five rows of our detachment, which usually consisted of 280 men. That favor was important. We had to line up early in the morning while it was still dark. Everybody was afraid of being late and of having to stand in the back rows. If men were required for an unpleasant, unpleasant and disliked job, the senior capo appeared and usually collected the men he needed from the back rows. These men had to march away to another especially dreaded kind of work under the command of strange guards. Occasionally, the senior capo chose men from the first five rows just to catch those who tried to be clever. All protests and entreaties were silenced by a few well-aimed kicks, and the chosen victims were chased to the meeting place with shouts and blows. However, as long as my capo felt the need of pouring out his heart, this could not happen to me. I had a guaranteed place of honor next to him. But there was another advantage, too. Like nearly all camp inmates, I was suffering from edema. My legs were so swollen and the skin on them so tightly stretched that I could scarcely bend my knees. I had to leave my shoes unlaced in order to make them fit my swollen feet. There would not have been a place for socks even if I had any, so my f partly bare feet were always wet and my shoes were always full of snow. This of course caused frostbite and chillbanes. 
Every single step became real torture. Clumps of ice formed on our shoes during our marches over snow-covered fields. Over and again, men slipped and those following behind stumbled on top of them. Then the column would stop for a moment, but not for long. One of the guards soon took action and worked over the men with the butt of his rifle to make them get up quickly. The more the front of the column you were, the less often you were disturbed by having to stop and then to make up for lost time by running on your painful feet. I was very happy to be in the personally appointed physician to his honor, the capo, and to march in the first row at even pace. As an additional payment for my services, I could be sure that as long as soup was being dealt at our lunchtime at our work site, he would then, when my turn came, dip the ladle right to the bottom of the vat and fish out a few peas. This capo, a former army officer, even had the courage to whisper to the foreman, whom I quarreled with, that he knew me to be an unusually good worker. That didn't help matters, but he nevertheless managed to save my life, one of the many times it would be saved. The day after the episode with the foreman, he smuggled me into another work party. There were foremen who felt sorry for us and who did their best to ease our situation, at least at the building site, but even they kept on reminding us that an ordinary laborer did several times as much work as we did, in a shorter time too. But they did see reason if they were told that normal workmen did not live on ten and a half ounces of bread, theoretically we actually had less, and one and three quarter pints of thin soup per day, that a normal laborer did not live under the mental stress we had to submit to, not having news of our families who had either been sent to another camp or gassed right away, that a normal workman was not threatened by death continuously, daily, hourly. I even allowed myself to say once to a kindly foreman, quote, if you could learn from me how to do a brain operation in as short a time as I am learning this road work from you, I would have great respect for you and he had grinned. Apathy, the main symptom of the second phase, was the necessary mechanism of self-defense. Reality dimmed and all efforts and emotions were centered on one task, preserving one's own life and that of the other fellow. It was typical to hear the prisoners while they were being herded back to camp from their work sites in the evening, sigh with relief and say, well, another day's over. It can be readily understood that such a state of strain, coupled with the constant necessity of concentrating on the task of staying alive, forced the prisoner's inner life down to a primitive level. Several of my colleagues in camp who were trained in psychoanalysis often spoke of regression in the camp inmate, a retreat to a more primitive form of mental life. His wishes and desires become obvious in his dreams. What did the prisoner dream about most frequently? Bread, cake, cigarettes, nice warm baths. The lack of having these simple desires satisfied led him to seek wishful fulfillment in dreams. Whether these dreams did any good is another matter. The dreamer had to wake from them to the reality of camp life and to the terrible contrast between that and his dream illusions. I shall never forget how I was roused one night by the groans of a fellow prisoner who threw himself about in his sleep, obviously having a horrible nightmare. Since I had all, always been especially sorry for people who suffered from fearful dreams of delirium, I wanted to wake the poor man. Suddenly I drew back the hand with which was ready to shake him, frightened at the thing I was about to do. At that moment, I became intensely conscious of the fact that no dream, no matter how horrible, could be as bad as the reality of the camp which surrounded us and to which I was about to recall him. Because of the high degree of undernourishment which the prisoners suffered, it was natural that the desire for food was the major primitive instinct around which mental life centered. Let us observe the majority of prisoners when they happened to work near each other and were, for once, not closely watched. They would immediately start discussing food. One fellow would ask another working next to him in the ditch what his favorite dishes were. Then they would exchange recipes and plan the menu for the day they would have a reunion, the day in a distant future when they would be liberated and returned home. They would go on and on, picturing it all in detail until suddenly a warning was passed down the trench, usually in the form of a special password or number. The guard is coming. I always regarded the discussions about food as dangerous. It is not wrong to provoke the organism with such detailed and effective pictures of delicacies when it has some, somehow managed to adapt itself to extremely small rations and low calories. Though it may afford momentary psychological relief, 
It is an illusion which psychologically, surely, must not be without danger. During the latter part of our imprisonment, the daily ration consisted of very watery soup given out once daily and the us usual small bread ration. In addition to that, there was the so-called extra allowance, consisting of three-fourths of an ounce of margarine or a slice of poor quality sausage or a little piece of cheese or a bit of synthetic honey or a spoonful of watering, watery jam varying daily. In calories, this diet was absolutely inadequate, especially taking into consideration our heavy manual work and our constant exposure to the cold in inadequate clothing. The sick who were under special care, that is, those who were allowed to lie in the huts instead of leaving the camp for work, were even worse off. When the last layers of subcutaneous fat had vanished, and we all looked like skeletons disguised with skin and rags, we could watch our bodies beginning to devour themselves. The organism digested its own protein, and the muscles disappeared. Then the body had no powers of resistance left. One after another, the members of the little community in our hut died. Each of us could calculate with fair accuracy whose turn it would be next, and when his own would come. After many observations, we knew the symptoms well, which made the correctness of our prognoses quite certain. Quote, he won't last long, or he's the next one, we whispered to each other. And when during our daily search for lice, we saw our own naked bodies in the evening, we thought alike, this body here, my body, is really a corpse already. What has become for me? I am but a small portion of a great mass of human flesh, of a mass behind barbed wire crowded into a few earthen huts, a mass of which daily a certain portion begins to rot because it has become lifeless. I mentioned above how unavoidable were the thoughts about food and favorite dishes which forced themselves into the consciousness of the prisoner whenever he had a moment to spare. Perhaps it can be understood then that even the strongest of us was longing for the time when he would have fairly good food again, not for the sake of good food itself, but for the sake of knowing that the subhuman existence which had made us unable to think of anything other than food would at last cease. Those who have not gone through a similar experience can hardly conceive, conceive of the soul-destroying mental conflict, the clashes of will power, which a famished man experiences. They can hardly grasp what it means to stand digging in a trench, listening for only the siren to announce 9.30 or 10 o'clock a.m., the half-hour lunch interval, when bread would be rationed, as long as it was still available, repeatedly asking the foreman, if he wasn't a disagreeable fellow, what the time was and tenderly touching a piece of bread in one's coat pocket, first stroking it with frozen gloveless fingers, then breaking off a crumb and putting it in one's mouth, and finally, with the last bit of willpower, pocketing it, uh, it again, at having promised oneself that morning to hold out till afternoon. We could hold endless debates on the sense or nonsense of certain methods of dealing with the small bread rations, which were given out only once daily during the latter part of our confinement. There were two schools of thought. One was in favor of eating up the ration immediately. This had the twofold advantage of satisfying the worst hunger pangs for a very short time, at least once a day, and of safeguarding against possible theft or loss of the ration. The second group, which held with dividing the ration up, used different arguments. I finally joined their ranks. The most ghastly moment of the 24 hours of the camp life was the awakening, when, at a still nocturnal hour, the three shrill blows of a whistle tore us pitilessly from our exhausted sleep and from the longings in our dreams. We then began the tussle with our wet shoes into which we could scarcely force our feet, which were sore and swollen with edema. And there were the usual moans and groans about petty troubles such as the snapping of wires which replaced shoelaces. One morning I heard someone whom I knew to be brave and dignified, cry like a child because he finally had to go to the snowy marching grounds in his bare feet, as his shoes were too shrunken for him to wear. In those ghastly minutes, I found a little bit of comfort, a small piece of bread, which I drew out of my pocket and munched with absorbed delight. Undernourishment, besides being the cause of the general preoccupation with food, probably also explains the fact that the sexual urge was generally absent. Apart from the initial effects of shock, this appears to be the only explanation of the phenomenon which a psychologist was bound to observe in those all-male camps, that, as opposed to all other strictly male establishments, such as army barracks, there was little sexual perversion. 
Even in his dreams, the prisoner did not seem to concern himself with sex, although his frustrated emotions and his finer, higher feelings did find definite expression in them. With the majority of the prisoners, the primitive life and the effort of having to concentrate on just saving one's skin led to a total disregard of anything not serving that purpose and explained the prisoner's complete lack of sentiment. This was brought home to me on my transfer from Auschwitz to a camp affiliated with Dachau. Let's not go Dachau. The train which carried about 2,000 prisoners passed through Vienna. At about midnight, we passed one of the Viennese railway stations. The track was going to lead us past the street where I was born, past the house where I had lived many years of my life, in fact, until I was taken prisoner. There were 50 of us in the prison car, which had two small barred peepholes. There was only enough room for one group to squat in the corner, while the others, who had to stand up for hours, crowded around the peepholes, standing on tiptoe and looking past the others' heads through the bars of the window. I caught an eerie glimpse of my native town. We all felt more dead than alive, since we thought that our transport was heading for the camp at Mauthausen, and that we had only one or two weeks to live. I had a distinct feeling that I saw the streets, the squares, and the houses of my childhood with the eyes of a dead man who had come back from another world and was looking down on a ghost city. After hours of delay, the train left the station, and there was the street, my street. The young lads who had a number of years of camp life behind them and for whom such a journey was a great event stared attentively through the peephole. I began to beg them, to entreat them, to let me stand in front for one moment only. I tried to explain how much a look through that window meant to me just then. My request was refused with rudeness and cynicism. You lived here all those years? Well then, you've seen quite enough already. In general, there was also a cultural hibernation in the camp. There were two exceptions to this, politics and religion. Politics were talked about everywhere in the camp, almost continuously. The discussions were based chiefly on rumors, which were snapped up and passed around avidly. The rumors about the military situation were usually contradictory. They followed one another rapidly and succeeded only in making a contribution to the war of nerves that was waged in the minds of all the prisoners. Many times, hopes for a speedy end to the war, which had been fanned by optimistic rumors, were disappointed. Some men lost all hope, but it was the incorrigible optimists, incorrigible optimists who were the most irritating companions. The religious interest of the prisoners, as far as soon as it developed, as far and as soon as it developed, was the most sincere imaginable. The depth and vigor of religious belief often surprised and moved a new arrival. Most impressive in this connection were improvised prayers or services in the corner of a hut or in the darkness of a locked cattle truck in which we were brought back from a distant work site, tired, hungry, and frozen in our ragged clothing. In the winter and spring of 1945, there was an outbreak of typhus which infected nearly all the prisoners. The mortality was great among the weak, who had to keep on with their hard work as long as they possibly could. The quarters for the sick were most inadequate. There were practically no medicines or attendants. Some of the symptoms of the disease were extremely disagreeable, an irre irrepressible aversion to even a scrap of food, which was an additional danger to life and terrible attacks of delirium. The worst case of delirium was suffered by a friend of mine who thought that he was dying and wanted to pray. In his delirium, he could not find the words to do so. To avoid these attacks of delirium, I tried, as many did, as did many of the others, to keep awake for most of the night. For hours, I composed speeches in my mind. Eventually, I began to reconstruct the manuscript which I had lost in the disinfection chamber at Auschwitz and scribbled the key words in shorthand on tiny scraps of paper. Occasionally, a scientific debate developed in camp. Once I witnessed something I had never seen, even in my normal life, although it lay somewhat near my own professional interests, a spiritualistic seance. I had been invited to attend by the camp's chief doctor, who was also a prisoner, who knew that I was a specialist in psychiatry. The meeting took place in his small private room in the sick quarters. A small circle had gathered, among them quite illegally, the warrant officer from the sanitation squad. One man began to invoke the spirits with a kind of prayer. The camp's clerk sat in front of a blank sheet of paper without any conscious intentions of, intentions of writing. During the next ten minutes, 
after which time the seance was terminated because of the medium's failure to conjure the spirits, his pencil slowly drew lines across the paper, forming quite legibly V-A-E-V. -E it was asserted that the, the clerk had never learned Latin and that he had never before heard the words Ve Victus, woe to the vanquished. In my opinion, he must have heard them once in his life without recollecting them, and they must have been available to the spirit, the spirit of his subconscious, at that time, a few months before our liberation and the end of the war. Almost done, guys. In spite of all the enforced physical and mental primitiveness of the life in the concentration camp, it was possible for spiritual life to deepen. Sensitive people who are used to a rich intellectual life may have suffered much pain. They were often of a delicate constitution, but the damage to their inner selves was less. They were able to retreat from their terrible surroundings to a life of inner riches and spiritual freedom. Only in this way can one explain the apparent paradox that some prisoners of a less hardy makeup often seem to survive camp life better than did those of a robust nature. In order to make myself clear, I am forced to fall back on personal experience. Let me tell you what happened on those early mornings when we had to march to our work site. There were shouted commands. Detachment, forward march, left, two, three, four, left, two, three, four. First man about, left and left and left and left, caps off. These words sound in my ears even today. At the order of caps off, we passed the gate of a camp, and searchlights were trained upon us. Whoever did not march smartly got a kick, and worse off was the man who, because of the cold, had pulled off his cap back over his, or pulled his cap back over his ears before permission was given. We stumbled on in the darkness over big stones through large puddles, along one road leading from the camp. The accompanying guards kept shouting at us and driving us with the butts of their rifles. Anyone with very sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. Hardly a word was spoken. The icy wind did not encourage talk. Hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, the man marching next to me whispered suddenly, If our wives could see us now. I do hope they're better off in their camps and don't know what is happening to us. That brought thoughts of my own wife to mind. As we stumbled on for miles, slipping on icy spots, supporting each other time and again, dragging one another up and onward, nothing was said, but we both knew each of us was thinking of his wife. Occasionally I looked at the sky, where the stars were fading and the pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds, but my mind clung to my wife's image imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me, saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. Real or not, her look was then more luminous than the sun which was beginning to rise. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth, that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which a man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of a man is through love and in love. I understand how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a brief moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. In a position of utter desolation, when man cannot express himself in positive action, when his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way, the honorable way. In such a position, man can, through loving contemplation of the image he carries of his beloved, achieve fulfillment. For the first time in my life, I was able to understand the meaning of those words. The angels are lost in perpetual contemplation of an infinite glory. In front of me, a man stumbled, and those following him fell on top of him. The guard rushed over and used his whip on them all. Thus my thoughts were interrupted for a few minutes, but soon my soul found its way back from the prisoner's existence into another world, and I resumed talk with my loved one. I asked her questions, and she answered. She questioned me in return, and I answered. Stop! We had arrived at our work site. Everybody rushed into the dark hut in the hope of getting fairly decent tools. Each prisoner got a spade or a pickaxe. 
Can't you hurry up, you pigs? Soon we had resumed the previous day's positions in the ditch. The frozen ground cracked under the, point, under the point of the pickaxes, and sparks flew. The men were silent. Their brains were numb. My mind still clung to the image of my wife. A thought crossed my mind. I didn't even know if she was still alive. I knew only one thing, which I have learned well by now. Love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. It finds its deepest meaning in this spiritual being, his inner self. Whether or not he is actually present, whether or not he is still alive at all, ceases somehow to be of any importance. I did not know whether my wife was alive, and I had no means of finding out. During my prison life, there was no outgoing or incoming mail. But at that moment, it ceased to matter. There was no need for me to know. Nothing could touch the strength of my love, my thoughts, and the image of my beloved. I had known then that my wife was dead. I think that I would have still given myself, undisturbed by that knowledge, to the contemplation of her image, and that my mental conversation with her would have been just as vivid and just as satisfying. Quote, Set me like a seal upon thy heart. Love is as strong as death. This intensification of inner life helped the prisoner find a refuge from the emptiness, desolation, and spiritual poverty of his existence by letting him escape into the past. When given free reign, his imagination played with past events, often not important ones, but minor happenings and trifling things. His nostalgic memory glorified them and they assumed a strange character. Their world and their existence seemed very distant and the spirit reached out for them longingly. In my mind, I took bus rides, unlocked the front door of my apartment, answered my telephone, switched on the electric lights. Our thoughts, thoughts often centered on such details, and these memories could move, on to te move one to tears. As the inner life of the prisoner tended to become more intense, he also experienced the beauty of art and nature as never before. Under their influence, he sometimes even forgot his own frightful circumstances. If someone had seen our faces on the journey from Auschwitz to a Bavarian camp as we beheld the mountains of Salzburg with their summits glowing on the sunset, through the little barred windows of the prison carriage, he would never have believed that those were the faces of men who had given up all hope of life and liberty. Despite that factor, or maybe because of it, we were carried away by nature's beauty, which we had missed for so long. In camp, too, a man might draw the attention of a comrade working next to him to a nice view of the setting sun shining through the tall trees of the Bavarian woods, as in the famous watercolor by Dürer, the same woods in which we had built an enormous hidden multi-munitions plant. One evening, we were already resting on the floor of our hut, dead tired, soup bowls in hand, a fellow prisoner rushed in and asked us to run out to the assembly grounds and see the wonderful sunset. Standing outside, we saw sinister clouds glowing in the west, and the whole sky alive with clouds of ever-changing shapes and colors, from steel blue to blood red. The desolate gray mud huts provided a sharp contrast, while the puddles on the muddy ground reflected the glowing sky. Then, after minutes of moving silence, one prisoner said to another, How beautiful the world could be! Another time we were at work in a trench. The dawn was gray around us. Gray was the sky above, gray the snow and the pale light of the dawn, gray the rags in which my fellow prisoners were clad, and gray their faces. I was again conversing silently with my wife, or perhaps I was struggling to find the reason for my sufferings, my slow dying. In a last violent protest against the hopelessness of imminent death, I sensed my spirit piercing through the enveloping gloom. I felt it transcend that hopeless, meaningless world, and from somewhere I heard a victorious yes in answer to my question of the existence of an ultimate purpose. At that moment, a light was lit in a distant farmhouse, which stood on the horizon as if painted there, in the midst of the miserable gray of dawn, dawning morning in Bavaria, at Lux in Tenebris Lucet, and the light shineth in the darkness. For hours, I stood hacking at the icy ground. The guard passed by, insulting me, and once again I communed with my beloved. More and more, I felt that she was present. 
that she was with me, I had the feeling that I was able to touch her, able to stretch out my hand and grasp hers. The feeling was very strong. She was there. Then, at that very moment, a bird flew down silently and perched just in front of me on a heap of soil which I had dug up from the ditch and looked steadily at me. Earlier I mentioned art. Is there such a thing in a concentration camp? It rather depends on what one chooses to call art. A kind of cabaret was improvised from time to time. A hut was cleared temporarily. A few wooden benches were pushed or nailed together and a program was drawn up. In the evening, those who had fairly good positions in the camp, the kapos and the workers who did not have to leave camp on distant marches, assembled there. They came to have a few laughs, laughs or perhaps a cry a little, anyway, just to forget. There were songs, poems, jokes, some with underlying satire regarding the camp. All were meant to help us forget, and they did help. That's what I'm trying to do with this show, man. The gatherings were so effective that a few ordinary prisoners went to see the cabaret in spite of their fatigue, even though they missed their daily portion of food by going. During the half-hour lunch interval, when the soup, which the contractors paid for and for which they did not spend anything, was ladled out at our work site, we were allowed to assemble in an unfinished engine room. On entering, everyone got a ladle full of the watery soup. While we sipped it greedily, a prisoner climbed onto a tub and sang Italian arias. We enjoyed the songs, and he was guaranteed a double helping of soup, straight from the bottom, that meant with some peas. Rewards were given in camp not only for entertainment, but also for applause. I, for example, could have found protection, how lucky I was never to need of it, from the camp's most dreaded capo, who for more than one good reason was known as the murderous capo. This is how it happened. One evening, I had a great, the great honor of being invited again to the room where the spiritualistic seance had taken place. There were gathered the same intimate friends of the chief doctor and most illegally the warrant officer from the sanitation squad was again present. The murderous capo entered the room by chance and he was asked to recite one of his poems, which had become famous or infamous in the camp. He did not need to be asked twice and quickly produced a kind of diary from which he began to read samples of his art. I bit my lips till they hurt in order to keep from laughing at one of his love poems, and very likely that saved my life, since I was also generous with my applause. My life might have been saved even if I had my life might have been saved even if I had been detailed to his working party to which I had previously been assigned for one day, a day that was quite enough for me. It was useful, anyway, to be known to the murderous capo from a favorable angle, so I applauded as hard as I could. Generally speaking, of course, any pursuit of art in a camp is somewhat grotesque. I would say that the real impression made by anything connected with art arose only from the ghost-like contrast between the performance and the background of the desolate camp life. I shall never forget how I awoke from the deep sleep of exhaustion on my second night in Auschwitz, roused by music. The senior warden of the hut had some kind of celebration in his room, which was near the entrance of the hut. Tipsy voices bawled some hackneyed tunes. Suddenly, there was a silence, and into the night, a violin sang a desperately sad tango, an unusual tune not spoiled by frequent playing. The violin wept, and a part of me wept with it, for on that same day, someone had a 24th birthday. That someone lay in another part of Auschwitz camp possibly only a few hundred or a few thousand yards away, and yet completely out of reach. That someone was my wife. So we'll call it there today, guys. I don't want to go too long, but uh, I'll do at least three more episodes about that length or shorter. You get the idea. I can't possibly explain this as well as the book can, but take it from me. What this is all about is... Viktor Frankl is known for logotherapy, which is a way of psychologically reframing and how you can defend yourself from psychological trauma, even in the worst situations, by simply reframing. And we're going to break that down. He's going to break it down. Um, there's about 45 more pages or so of this, maybe 50 more pages or so of this. So another episode to finish up his experiences in the concentration camp. And then we will move on to logotherapy 
and reframing to help with trauma. I feel like that's something everybody should know. And again, please read the book. It's better if you read it yourself. I'm doing my best here, but you know, it's always best if you read it yourself. It's a wonderful experience. As you can see, it's he's a tremendous writer and the this book packs an enormous emotional punch. So Keep fighting the good fight out there, guys. I'll get the second part of the concentration camp to you sometime next week.